from Quito, Ecuador. My name is Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South, the daily news brief on Telesur English. And we begin this new edition right now. Venezuela's ruling socialists have won a resounding victory in Sunday's local elections. The PSUV and its allies took the major's position in 308 of 335 municipalities, as well as the governorship in the state of Zulia. The National Electoral Council Vice President Sandra Oblitas said that these were the third elections in less than six months, with the participation of 9 million people, which represents 47% of the electoral registry. People across the country took to the streets in support of the new elected officials. In the capital city, members of the Socialist Party gathered together in Plaza Bolívar to celebrate the victory of Erika Farias, the first woman to be appointed mayor of Caracas. During this event, President Nicolás Maduro called the election results a great victory for the country. Today is the victory of Venezuelan people against the imperialism of Donald Trump. Go home, Donald Trump. Get out of Venezuela. Our correspondent in Caracas, Fredin Gillingham, followed the day's events. Polling stations from the early hours of Sunday morning. It's a habit that has become all too familiar in a country where participatory democracy could not be more important. Yes, I voted. I believe deeply in democracy. I think we can let others do what they want. It's our responsibility and it's our future. The country is in our hands. This process was really fast. I just came a few minutes ago and I have voted already. I feel this is an important decision for all Venezuelans in this hard time. And it's good that everybody comes to vote because taking our decision is the only way to build our country. Three of Venezuela's main opposition parties boycotted Sunday's vote with leaders threatening to throw out any of their candidates who put themselves up for election. However, some smaller opposition parties defied the boycott and ran candidates. In Caracas's Sucre municipality, a polling station frequented by opposition supporters showed that some still had high hopes. Claims by the opposition that Venezuela's electoral process contained so-called irregularities dissuaded many of their supporters from coming out to vote on the day. However, Telesor caught up with a specialist from Spain who is one of 50 international experts accompanying the election. I am very surprised because of the Venezuelan electoral system, because thinking that on this year Venezuela has had elections and coming from Spain, a country that thinks that Venezuela is a dictatorship, to see a different reality with a secure and reliable technical system. For example, in my country, we keep the manual vote, with less guarantees, without fingerprinting, digitalization, biometric systems, and here you can see a process that is part of a more active participation of people. At the end of a long day, Venezuelans who did take part gathered in Plaza Bolivar, to where an estimated 9 million had participated. And in the capital, news of an overwhelming victory for the ruling socialists was met with jubilation. It's not the new mayors who will benefit most from Sunday's results. It's the people who will be able to communicate their basic needs and demands to a new local mayor who was elected by them. Freddie Gillingham, Telesor, Caracas. And we'll come back with more news on this key election in Venezuela. Now we move to Honduras, where thousands of people took to the streets on the main cities of the country once again to protest against their irregularities in this electoral process of November 26. Citizens and social leaders are condemning U.S. intervention in this process. People from all social and economic backgrounds marched through the streets of Honduras demanding a solution to the crisis. It's gotten worse. There's nothing better for us. It's worse every day. Several popular organizations also made an appearance to denounce the human rights violations that the Honduran population is currently suffering. So far there have been 16 killings and over 620 people wounded during all these protest activities. But there are also countless people jailed, 
legal and illegally, who we haven't been able to count yet. There are hundreds of them. Meanwhile, opposition alliance leaders condemn the intervention of the United States government in the electoral process, which still keeps the Honduran population waiting. He won't be able to govern because the protest will be permanent. It will be a big mistake for the United States to support a president that people don't want. As long as they review just the voting tallies and not the votes themselves, one by one, and as long as they don't conduct a forensic audit of the system itself, none of this is valid. In Tegucigalpa, people marched to the government house and the United States Embassy in protest to this intervention. People know that negotiations take place in the United States Embassy. That's why people are very upset, because what's the point if the president has already been chosen inside the United States Embassy? The protesters said they will need to block the roads to put pressure for their vote to be respected and for electoral transparency. A correspondent, Heather Gies, joins us now on the phone from Tegucigalpa. Heather, the electoral authority says that the partial recount still gives victory to President Hernandez. What is the opposition saying now? We are also hearing uh, more protests in the capital. So this partial recount that was completed uh, by the Supreme Electoral Tribunal at a recommendation from the Organization of American States is far from resolving the doubts around this election and the allegations of fraud. This was a partial recount of just over 4,000 700 ballot boxes, which is just over a quarter of the complete recount of more than 18,000 ballot boxes that the Opposition Alliance is calling for. It, the Opposition has also uh, criticized this recount because it simply looked at the ballots and it did not compare um, the vote count with the voter rolls and the signatures, which they say is essential to uh, be completely transparent in this vote counting process and detect uh, further possible fraud. So on Friday, but right as this uh, re partial recount was um, getting underway, the Opposition Alliance officially, formally petitioned the Supreme Electoral Tribunal to nullify the vote count, which, if accepted, uh, and they expect it won't be accepted, but if it were, this would allow them to push for a full recount, including a comparison with the voter rolls and signatures of the full 18,000 ballot boxes. At the same time, the Liberal Party uh, petitioned the Supreme Electoral Tribunal to completely void the entire electoral process, which if accepted, and again, it's not expected that it would be accepted, uh, would uh, logically lead to fresh elections. So there are plenty of um, doubts still around the election, plenty of opposition demands for a more transparent process, but the sense is that this partial recount uh, gives the Supreme Electoral Tribunal the seal of approval it needed to go ahead and announce uh, President Juan Orlando Hernandez as the new president. Of course, if this is done, it will just further fuel the outrage and the popular protest. Yesterday, again, there was a protest of thousands of people in the capital city, and they also mobilized in other parts of the, of the country. And we're simply hearing that Opposition supporters will continue to be in the street until the Supreme Electoral Tribunal announces the election result that they believe is the rightful one, being that Salvador Nazarella won the election. Thank you very much, Heather, for your report. We'll be following any updates in Honduras. We'll come back with more news in a minute. Stay with us. The government in Argentina has denied entry to two journalists who had traveled to cover the World Trade Organization ministerial meeting in Buenos Aires. One of those deported was Sally Birch, a British journalist based in Ecuador who has worked for many years with the alternative news service Alay. She had told Telesu what happened. I was in a group of representatives of civil society registered for the WTO uh, ministerial meeting in Geneva um, and about 60 of us were denied subsequently having been accepted by the WTO, denied 
uh, being able to participate uh, in the meeting by the Argentine government. But supposedly we were able to travel to the country to participate in, in the parallel events. And when I got there, um, they had my name on a list. They started asking questions and uh, they finally decided to deport me. Um, as far as I can understand, I mean, they gave a pretext about false tourism because normally when journalists travel, we say we, we, we travel as tourists, you know. Um, but as I was going to do journalism, they said that that was a false pretext. That was the pretext for sending me out. I think the main reason is that they are trying to limit dissident voices on the kind of projects that the, the WTO and the Argentine government are supporting uh, on issues such as um, e-commerce uh, and, and others. No, I work particularly on that issue um, and I think that's, that's the only reason I can find for them having rejected me being able to enter the country. Um, the the e-commerce proposals are basically defending the agenda of the big multinational corporations and are not at all in the interests of developing countries. And also in Argentina, it's over three weeks since the Ara San Juan submarine went missing in Argentina's southern sea. Our correspondent Edgardo Esteban is in Buenos Aires and has more details. Dia numero 26. It's been 26 days since the Ara San Juan submarine disappeared in Argentina's southern sea. This accident remains a mystery despite the big search operation launched during the first days with the support from different countries and until today there has been no signs of the location of the submarine and the 41 crew members. The country's armed forces announced they have stopped looking for survivors and the army's chief said there are very few chances to find the submarine and clarify the reasons for its disappearance. The families of the crew members have asked the government of Mauricio Macri to give them an explanation, although they have also harshly criticized him, saying that he's not committed to this search and hasn't even supported them during this painful time. Families remain hopeful that authorities can give them some answers about the location of the submarine to mourn their loved ones. That was Edgardo Esteban from Argentina. Now moving to Brazil, where the Homeless Workers Movement, or MTST, has turned 20 years old, and it celebrated with a massive event in the city of Sao Paulo. The event included a concert by the legendary musician Caetano Veloso, among other guest artists. In a country where over 6 million families are homeless, the biggest movement for the struggle for housing in South America celebrated their 20th anniversary in the Rio da Batata Square. This movement has such a large following because it struggles against one of the biggest inequalities in Brazil, which is the fact that many people don't have the right to live, the basic right of a home, so that the MSTS organizes these families to fight for the right of a home, and we get to fight for those who have been denied rights through the struggle and mobilizations occupying streets, squares and lands. After a previous performance of Caetano Veloso during another occupation was censored, the musician was able to sing along with other guests to thousands of supporters against ultra-conservative groups and institutional repression. What they got is the Caetano Veloso show. That was supposed to be for 7,000 in San Bernardo, which then became 30,000 people in La Batata Square for the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the MTST. Recent reports about the people without fear occupation breaks the preconceptions of the elites against the homeless. Over 73.1% of the inhabitants of this occupation are economically active and their average income doesn't surpass $400. There's also an important decrease of people who dropped out of school after the age of 14. This is my life. The MTST is my life because if it wasn't for it, I wouldn't have a house to live in. My mother died and I lived in a house with my father, but he wants to kick us out. But I went to the movement and now I'll have my own house. With the paralyzed housing programs, an unemployment record and insufficient wages to afford rent, the homeless movement is now an urban reference on the fight against the unelected government and at the same time a support system for the victims of its neoliberal policies. 
The Frente Brasil Popular Movement held its national conference in Sao Paulo during this weekend. Around 350 delegates from 23 states around the country debated about a solution to the new pension reform pushed by President Michel Temer to be voted in Congress in the next few days. They discussed several measures to face the political, social and environmental crisis hit in Brazil. The movement also confirmed its support to the candidacy, can candidacy of former President Lula da Silva. This conference shows that we understand this decisive moment we're living in. We need to stop the pension reform. We need to define our project and debate on the measure we want to propose, a project that strengthens the Frente Brasil Popular. This second assembly helped us adjust our strategies so that our project can be debated. We are very happy because representatives from 23 states from around the country came together with more than 350 delegates. We want to build a national project so that the next year we can organize the People's Great Congress. Social movements in Panama are requesting a national day of mourning on December 20th in memory of the 1989 U.S. invasion. During a photo exhibition, social activists say they want to raise awareness of the military invasion which resulted in the death of over 3,000 victims and the destruction of their democracy. They also criticize previous governments who have failed to honor their own people by failing to mark this date. We are ashamed of the oligarchies of the past. However, since the invasion, Panama's popular social movements have been raising flag of historic memory and record, and today we are calling for the recognition of December the 20th as a national day of remembrance. We are fully convinced that history will be on our side. Mexican filmmaker Guillermo del Toro's new film, The Shape of Water, leads the nominations for the 2018 Golden Globe Awards. With seven nominations, including Best Picture Drama, Best Director and Best Actress, Del Toro's film has captivated audiences as well as critics who have, co have called it an emotionally absorbing story. The film previously won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. Although Peru has one of the richest sea coasts in the world, official sources state that 70% of the fish that people consume is imported. Why does this happen and who does this benefit? We'll tell you more in the next report. Along the Peruvian shore, more than 60,000 fishermen provide the market with fish for human consumption, according to the Ministry of Production. But this same institution declared that only three out of every 10 fish conserves are produced in Peru. We have the best fish in Peru. I don't know why we need to import anything. We have all the raw material. People come from other countries, they take our goods, and then they sell them back to us. According to the Fishing Federation, this happens due to President Kuczynski's neoliberal politics, which allow transnationals to fish 2.8 million tons of Peruvian anchoveta, while independent Peruvian fishermen can only fish a tenth of that figure through the whole year. Supreme decrees are given, which favor a few companies by allowing them to produce nothing but fish flow. They don't care about independent companies and what they can do for our internal market. This has been extremely prejudicial to the market. In this way, independent fish concert factories have seen the raw material rated. In Ancash region, for example, independent companies to let go over 60,000 employees, according to the union's guild. Unfortunately, in our country, we always put the big corporations in front of small businesses or independent companies, even if the latter can become investments that will feed the population and can lead to a national conserves company which will benefit everyone. Policies of trade liberalization are another factor that negatively influence this sector. Small fish concert companies tell us that they have to compete with imported products which are subsidized in their countries of origin and which are allowed to enter Peru paying almost zero taxes. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Russian President Vladimir Putin has ordered the partial withdrawal of Russian troops from Syria. Putin made a surprise visit to the Kameinin Air Base in Syria and announced the beginning of the withdrawal of Russian, Russian troops from the country. He was greeted by Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and he also met with the Russian Air Force, thanking them for their service and wishing them a safe trip back to their homeland. Our correspondent Hisham Wanos has more details in the next report. During his tour around Egypt and Turkey, Russia's President Vladimir Putin detoured to Syria, where he met with the country's President Bashar al-Assad and the leader of Russia's Air Force, based in Syria since 2015 fighting the Islamic State group. During his surprise visit to Russia's Karmimim Air Base in Syria, Putin congratulated the military for fulfilling their duty in combating terrorism and ordered them to start withdrawing, declaring that their work was largely done. Putin also said that they will intervene again if the Islamic State group's terrorist activities continue, and they will do so with greater strength. Authorities and civilians in Syria are happy about the news and have taken Putin's announcement as a victory against terrorism. This is a step to find a permanent solution to the conflict in Syria, said Putin, adding that this is the perfect time to hold the Syrian National Dialogue Congress in Sochi to reach a diplomatic solution to the conflict. In the meantime, the eighth round of talks regarding peace in Syria is taking place in Geneva with the presence of the country's delegates, who rejected the opposition's declarations from Saudi Arabia that demanded the resignation of Bashar al-Assad and to start a political transition process in the country. Syria's offensive in the Hamas province and the outskirts of Damascus continue as military authorities promise to restore peace and safety in Syria. That was Hisham Wanus from Syria. The European Union has told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that it rejects U.S. President Donald Trump's decision on Jerusalem. The European Union's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, told Netanyahu that the, US, the EU recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of both Israel and Palestine. It was in response to Netanyahu's statement that he believes that the European countries will support Trump's move. We believe uh, that the only realistic solution to the conflict between Israel and Palestine is based on two states, with Jerusalem as the capital of both. The European Union will uh, increase its work together with our international friends and partners, but also with uh, friends and partners in the region, starting from Egypt and Jordan, uh, and obviously with the parties, with Israel and Palestine. Trump's recognition has continued to provoke protests across the world. A correspondent in Gaza, Nur Harassin, brings us the latest developments from Palestine. Since the day when Donald Trump decided to uh, recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, Jerusalem, uh, enraged and angry Palestinians have been heading to the uh, streets, uh, participating in set and protests and in rallies, clashing with the Israeli forces in different locations and parts, not only here in the Gaza Strip, but also in the uh, West Bank. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, the number of injuries is up to uh, 1,000. Thousand Palestinian injured in the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza, and only in Gaza there has been uh, four people uh, killed. Today uh, there is uh, it is a calm and peaceful uh, day in the Gaza Strip here. However, uh, youth groups on social media have asked more Palestinians to head to the uh, borders between Gaza and Israel to clash face to face with the. Israeli soldiers, so the hospitals in Gaza do expect more casualties to arrive to uh, the hospitals today. On the other hand, Egypt has invited the Palestinian president for special and uh, private talks regarding the issue of Jerusalem in order to take uh, serious steps um, against um, the uh, decision. The Palestinian people are hopeful that Egypt could achieve something uh, even more than uh, the U.S. as a mediator or a negotiator. There was no harassing from Gaza. An explosion at a Manhattan bus terminal has been called a suspected terrorist attack by the mayor of New York. The explosion struck one of the city's busiest commuter hubs, Port Authority, injuring four people. Police have arrested one suspect, 27-year-old Akayed Ula, who was found at the site of the blast with burns of the remains of an improvised low-tech 
pipe bomb style device, according to the New York Police Department. Now let's take a look at our World News Roundup. The EU says that an interim Brexit deal struck by the British Prime Minister and the European Commission is not legally binding, but Theresa May has committed her government to honouring a gentleman's agreement. The comment came after Britain's Brexit negotiator David Davis said on Sunday that guarantees on the Northern Ireland border were not legally binding unless the two sides reached a final deal. Formally speaking, the uh, joint report is not legally binding because it is not yet the Article 50 withdrawal agreement. But we see the joint report of Michel Barnier and David Davis as a deal between gentlemen. And it is the clear understanding that it is fully backed and endorsed by the UK government. President Juncker had a meeting with Prime Minister May last Friday morning to ascertain that this is precisely the case. They shook hands. The president of Tanzania, John Magafuli, has pardoned two child rapists who were serving life sentences for raping 10 girls in 2003. Magafuli made the announcement during the country's Independence Day speech on Saturday, saying the criminals had corrected their behavior. Children's rights activists have condemned the move. Firefighters are struggling to contain the wildfires in Southern California. Out of the six blazes, the largest is reportedly bigger than the size of New York City and Boston combined. The fire in Ventura and the Santa Barbara counties has consumed 230,000 acres in the past week. Scuffles broke out between hundreds of protesters and Catalan police outside the Jaeger Museum. Spanish police removed 44 disputed artworks from the Catalonian Cultural Center. A Spanish judge ordered last month that the pieces be returned to Aragon. We've come to the end of this daily news brief. This and many other news, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.